Okay, um, so I think I can start again. Uh, so, the last category of um, compact binary coalescence I want to talk about are extreme mass ratio wind spirals, a topic close to my heart, and I've worked on them for quite a while. Um, so, it's another type of binary. This is a binary in which you have a stellar origin um, remnant falling into a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. Why do we expect these things to occur? Well, we see that in the centers of most galaxies there are clusters of stars um, that are surrounding a dense object, which is most likely a black hole. So, there have been famous observations made of our, the center of our galaxy over uh, the years um, of uh, stars there. Um, in particular, there are these things called S stars, which you can see, and this is a real data, the observations of these stars moving over time, and uh, you can see them orbiting around and the center. That's one of the ways we know there's a black hole in the center of our galaxy. Um, but because you have stars in the centers of galaxies, uh, you can expect um, there to be uh, stellar remnants in the centers of galaxies, and you can expect these stellar remnants to um, encounter the black hole in the center uh, and lead to uh, another type of inspiral. Okay, so the standard picture for this is that you have a bunch of stars around your black hole, and these stars are moving around, um, when two stars come close to one another, they interact gravitationally, uh, this is a diffusive process, and so the orbits gradually evolve, their energy and their momentum changes over time, uh, and this leads to objects being put onto an orbit that takes it very close uh, to the black hole in the center. Okay, now when this happens, um, you have Burst of gravitational radiation um, comes out uh, as the object passes the black hole. This dissipates a bit of energy that you meant for the orbit, and it can leave the small object bound to the central black hole. Um, and then, oops, uh, uh, and then over a sequence of a million years or so, the small object absorbs uh, gradually decays uh, and eventually falls into the black hole in the center. Um, so the final stages of that process, when you have uh, when the orbital period of the small object that the black hole gets down to the sorts of frequencies of interest to Lisa, so we're talking periods of uh, an hour or so, um, you get a thing called an extreme mass ratio in spiral. So it's an in spiral of compact remnant. Uh, it could, in principle, be a white dwarf or an neutron star or a black hole. Although we expect that the things we observe will be dominated by black hole in spirals, um, but it's an inspiral atomic object into a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy. Uh, it's, it's, the gravitational wave frequency is dominated by, is, well, it's determined by the total mass of the system, uh, and in these sorts of uh, cases, that's the, basically the mass of the central black hole. So if that central black hole has the right mass, to put it in the Lisa range, which is 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7, uh, then these can be a Lisa source uh, during those final phases where the orbital period is all of an hour. Um, now, another thing that makes it interesting is that the inspiral is quite slow because of the extreme mass ratio. Uh, the radiation um, uh, it takes a long time for it to inspiral, and so you'll get many orbits uh, emitted in the Lisa band. So we can get as many as 100,000 uh, or more. <coughs> orbits that we observe, um, and this is important for uh, some of the science applications of memories, as we can use the small object as a probe of the space-time structure uh, of the larger black hole. Um, so how many memories are we likely to see? Uh, unlike the LIGO case, we don't have LISA yet, so we, don't, we haven't measured this number, uh, so we can try to predict it. Um, I'll go through some aspects of that, which will mostly indicate that we really don't know, um, but we do have numbers, uh, and the numbers are not zero. Um, we'll find out if they're real numbers or not. So, you need a number of ingredients to predict memory event rates. Um, we need to know how many black holes there are, uh, we need to know how many memories fall into black holes, uh, and we then also need to know how far away Lisa can uh, detect memories. So the first question, uh, as I was saying, the, uh, when I'm talking about the LISA comparable mass systems, we 
expect there to be black holes in the Lisa range, but we can observe many of them because we can't electromagnetically. Uh, and so there's a bit of uncertainty about what the mass function does below that 10 to the 7 sequences. Um, so if you take one type of extrapolation based on luminosities, uh, you expect the uh, mass function to go up. If you take uh, another extrapolation based on measurements of velocity dispersions, uh, there's some indication that it may turn down. Um, so we assume it's black. Okay, but it's so there is a, it's most likely that it's uh, a slow, but low masses is between plus 0.3 uh, in terms of the end log n, scales like n to some power, which is close to being flat, but could be as steep as plus 0.3 or as uh, negative as minus 0.3. Um, and these predictions are consistent with uh, numerical simulations if you take uh, one of these population 3C models that bolt it forward and extract the masses of black holes, uh, you tend to get things that lie along this minus 0.3, and uh, but that's based on certain assumptions, uh, and so you want to uh, allow for the possibility that it is more positive. Uh, in terms of what Lisa will see, it is better for us if the slope does something like this than if it does this, because then we have many more black holes in uh, the range that Lisa is sensitive to. Um, so, these simulations are good, uh, this is not so good, uh, and you'll see the effect that has on the numbers uh, in a minute. Um, to, so the next thing we need, we need is some estimate of how many, how often emeries fall into, uh, well, how often compact objects fall into black holes. Uh, we have Simulations of this have been over the years. Um, lots of simulations of the dynamics of stellar clusters with black holes in the center. Uh, the, you can do end body simulations and have all these more focal flight simulations of the, these systems, and they uh, lead to predictions for uh, objects that are falling into the center, um, and you can therefore estimate uh, rates. Um, there's a lot of complicated physics in this. Uh, you know, it sounds simple, you're just doing a simulation with, with gravitational interactions. Uh, but you find lots of interesting features there, things like resonant relaxation and uh, mass segregation and various other processes, which make this very complicated. And as people have studied this over 20 years, they just found uh, one thing after another. Uh, as they add in the, each new physical effect, the rate goes up a bit, and then in the, end, in the next one it goes down a bit. Um, fortunately, the, you know, it's tended to oscillate about uh, a number rather than go in a bad direction. Uh, but currently, we think that maybe for a black hole like the one in the center of our galaxy, which has a three million solar masses, uh, we'll have about 400 mergers uh, every million years. That's so a billion years. Um, we need to scale that to other masses, and these simulations suggest that the rate is higher for lighter black holes. Uh, and the slope is about minus 0.2, minus 0.19. Um, but, and you can't, well, if you take this at face value, there's a problem because um, the black holes that are light accrete more than their own mass through this process over the age of the universe. Okay, so it's clear that this model, which is what the simulations predict, can't be supported of the entire age of the universe or, um, because the black holes would get too um, So another complication here, um, here of if galaxy mergers. Um, observations of galaxy mergers suggest and simulations of mergers suggest that after the merger takes place, this nice cluster of stars surrounding the black hole gets disrupted. Okay, so if that happens, then you can't have memories for a period of time because the stars aren't there. The cusp eventually regrows as stars diffuse in from greater distances, but this takes a certain period of time. Um, so that's another thing that will reduce uh, the emitter rate uh, if you have mergers. One thing that can increase the merger rate is the chemical spins, um, because that can enhance the capture cross section. And the simulations typically assume the black hole is a Schwarzschild black hole. Um, that's a modest increase of maybe a factor of two at most. So this is uh, illustrating the first of those points. Um, 
This is basically the fraction of the total mass of the black hole. It would accumulate over 10 giga years, so the age of the universe. Uh, it gets accreted at the rate of the human matter formula, um, depending on the mass of the objects that were born here. Um, so you reach F equals 1, so the total mass has come from Emery's uh, at masses of about 100,000 solar masses. Um, so we, you, know, you can do things a bit more carefully then. Um, by so if we have one of these simulations of the mergers of black holes, we've tracked when things merge, and so we can account for this uh, cusp regrowth problem. Um, and then for the black holes that are lighter, we can reduce the uh, Emery rates to avoid this uh, overgrowing of the black holes as well. Um, so. The time it takes for a cusp to regrow is a bit uncertain. It depends on the physics uh, of the stellar system. Um, typical number will be a few giga years, so about half the age of the universe is the typical time. Uh, it can grow faster, so we can be optimistic and say it grows really quickly, up to two giga years, uh, or we can be pessimistic and basically say that after a merger, that system is never available again um, in a Hubble time uh, to. Uh, um, to be a host for an Emory. Okay, so there's you know, some complicated physics here. You, uh, you know, can uh, you know, put this all together and try and make some prediction for how many Emory's we're likely to see. Uh, another, so the other thing that has to go into this is some understanding of how far away Lisa can see Emory's, and that depends a lot on the properties of the compact object. Uh, in particular, masses and uh, excentricities and inclinations. So, uh, traditionally, in all of these calculations, we've assumed that black holes and the things that are falling into the supermassive black hole have mass about 10 times the mass of the sun. Because um, this is what we thought stellar mass black holes uh, are typical to stellar black hole <coughs> mass. Of course, when 159914 comes along, we have two black holes with mass about 30 solar masses. So if that is more typical, then that's uh, good in one sense, because we can see these systems further away. Uh, it means the overall rate has to be lower because of this overgrowth problem. But overall, if we assume heavier black holes falling into sets of galaxies, this is good, because uh, we can get more events. Um, eccentricity, so we expect the, in the final stages of merger that Emery's will be on eccentric orbits. Um, essentially because of this capture process where they start off with one with their uh, closest approach to the black hole, the apoap, so the periaps being uh, a few tens of m away uh, with the furthest point, the apoaps, out in the stellar cluster, so it's an extremely eccentric orbit. Uh, as it evolves into gravitational wave emission, the periaps remains you know, approximately in the same place for a long period of time while the apoaps moves in. Uh, but when it gets into the Lisa band, there's still some residual eccentricity, uh, which is typically moderate. So moderate means 0 0.2, 0 0.3 uh, at plunge, though there are scenarios in which it can be uh, higher. Um, inclination makes a bit of a difference to sensitivity, but there's no reason to suppose there's a preferential direction on which Emery's uh, form into the black hole. Uh, so we typically assume that is random at capture, uh, although. Uh, Retrograde in spirals are more likely to get perturbed away before they become Lisa sources. So you get a bias in your observed events towards things that are uh, in spiraling in the same direction as the black hole is spinning. Okay, so um, what this plot shows is uh, an estimate of the horizon. So it's say basically how far away in redshift. We expect to be able to see um, Emery's as a function of the uh, mass. Uh, the different colored curves correspond to slightly different assumptions um, about the, uh, the waveforms that we're using. The green ones here are based on uh, radiative um, perturbation theory calculations, solution of the Tchaikovsky equation, but for circular orbits. Uh, the others are based on uh, approximations. The Brecken Cutland Analytic Kluge model, uh, two different flavors of it. Um, we use this for other things, and so the purpose of this plot was to see how long you were getting uh, some of those answers when we compared it to the perturbation theory results. Uh, and the two versions of the field that we used kind 
the bracket, the, the true behavior. But if you look at these green curves, if uh, black holes are lights, the tensile masses, you can still see them out to almost a ratio of three. Uh, if the central mass is almost a million. Um, if black holes are heavier, so more like 15 or 9 14 black holes, and we get out to ratio to size five uh, with the current configuration of Lisa. Okay, so putting that all together, we end up with a number of uh, between 15 uh, and 3,000. Um, for our baseline uh, configuration, so that range uh, comes from varying assumptions in uh, the model, if we're more pessimistic, we tend to get fewer events. If we have a negative slope, then we also have fewer events, and so on. Uh, this table, which I won't go through in any detail, um, just shows what happens if you make different assumptions about the, uh, the instrument as well. So if you, uh, our baseline instrument now is two million, two and a half million quarter long arms, and six links, that means it has two laser beams going in, in each uh, direction or on each arm of the constellation. Um, if you make the instrument shorter, you lose about a factor of five events. Um, if you make it larger, you get about a factor of three. Uh, so this over here is, uh, essentially represents the original Lisa design that was discussed uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, there were, for a while, people were considering uh, a simpler version of Lisa in which there were uh, essentially laser links only on two of the three arms. Uh, this is a full link configuration. Uh, that has many disadvantages uh, in terms of memories that it uses your factor of two uh, in numbers of Okay, so but the bottom line is 10 to 1,000, uh, order of magnitude for number of memories. The uncertainty is there because of this uncertain astrophysics. Uh, one promising thing is the lower number we get is 10, uh, it is not zero, um, but we are making a number of assumptions here, uh, so we have to wait for Lisa to really measure this. Um, the fact that we get all of these cycles in the strong field allows us to measure parameters with MREs very precisely, and we expect uh, to get even better measurements of masses, uh, spins, and eccentricities with MREs than we do with massive black holes, because we have a uh, greater number of cycles, uh, and we can get down to precisions as low as. Uh, on the million for mass uh, in best cases, and typical is 10 to the We do a bit better on sky position too, because you can observe the signal for a long uh, period, um, and the velocity distances scale roughly to typical SNR of these systems, and SNR for these is about a few tens, so 20 or 30, uh, so we can get a few percent to a few tens of percent precision uh, on distance. Um, so I focused on the primary channel for forming these things, where you have the, this diffusion process in stellar clusters leading to objects getting close to the central black hole. Uh, over the, the past couple of decades, people have proposed a number of different mechanisms uh, that can lead to formation of memories. Uh, so one of these uh, involves uh, binary splitting. Uh, so the idea is that you have a stellar binary that is on itself on an orbit around a black hole. If it gets close enough, you can end up with a situation where the, the close object in the binary becomes gravitationally bound to the black hole, while the other one uh, gets ejected um, and forms a hypervelocity star. Uh, hypervelocity stars are observed in the Milky Way, so this process definitely takes place, um, and it will leave uh, the other object of the binary uh, in a relatively close orbit around the black hole, which will then eventually form a memory. Um, this process occurs a bit further, so this process will typically put you, uh, put the small object on a binary that has a larger perihelix and lower eccentricity, uh, so the system tends to be more circular when it gets into band, and so one observational difference between the two channels is that this will produce things that are circular or circular orbits. Rather than things that are orbits. 
Uh, another thing that does that is um, tidal stripping of massive stars. Um, it's a similar sort of process in some ways. You have now a massive star in orbit around the central black hole, uh, which has a core in it. Um, it gets close enough that the tidal field from the black hole uh, removes its envelope, um, and then the core of the star is left um, on an orbit around the central black hole. Again, that then evolves and forms an emery, which is on a reasonably uh, circular orbit. Um, a final channel people have talked about is uh, direct formation very close to the black hole um, in a black hole accretion disk. So if you have a black hole that's accreting, um, there can be instabilities in the accretion disk, which uh, leads to uh, collapse of regions of the disk to form um, objects, stars, which then evolve and create black holes. Uh, in this kind of process, you end up with compact objects on uh, orbits within the disk uh, around the black hole. And so these are not only uh, tend to be circular orbits, they tend to be in the equatorial plane of the black hole. And so that inclination to the black hole spin is something we can measure with gravitational waves, and so that's a, another indicator of the formation channel. Um, okay, yeah, so a couple of things. I already talked a bit about intermediate uh, mass systems. So a couple of related source types to Emery's uh, are EMR bursts. Um, in this early phase of the process where these objects are coming close to the black hole, losing a bit of energy and momentum and then going away again, uh, that produces bursts of radiation, which if it's happening in galaxies close to ours uh, or in the galactic center, um, there we potentially can see it. Then you also have intermediate mass ratio in spirals, which I mentioned a bit earlier. These are uh, in spirals where one of the objects is a um, thousand cell masses and then the, for LISA the other one is a million, for LIGO the other one might be uh, a cell object uh, in Emery's are highly uncertain so I'm not going to say much more about that at this point. Okay, so Emery's are sources for LISA. Um, as I said, the way we detect them is similar to some of the other methods, although it's a lot harder. Uh, it's harder because you have so many cycles and they're all in a strong field, you need a lot of templates. So I'll say a bit more about that later on uh, in this afternoon's lecture. But the, the basic techniques for finding emeries are similar to the other types of source. We do match filtering using templates, we can do stochastic searches, uh, and then we can also do uh, unnormal searches using uh, time frequency techniques um, and an approach called semi coherent searches, which I'll uh, say a bit more about. Um, to model Emery's, you need back of validation theory um, and <coughs> self force. Uh, these calculations have been progressing steadily over 20 plus years. Um, hopefully, we will soon have full second order results. Is that right, Nils? But at the moment, what we're using to scope out science with Emery's are all sort of long motion. Phenomenological models, uh, these are probably what we'll end up using for data analysis, though we'll need the self force calculations to calibrate these and also to verify which results. Uh, there are, I think these should say termed, anyway, uh, so there are a number of these that analytic kludge, uh, numerical kludge, or augmented analytic kludge, Australian element method. Um, I didn't know what to call your. <laughs> Thing. It's a bit like oscillating elements, but slightly different. Um, so, there are a number of different models in the literature. These are all you know, these are what we're going to need for data analysis, uh, and so they will continue to be developed um, and informed by the accurate calculations. Okay, so what can you do with Emery's? Um, you can do similar sorts of things that you can with other compact uh, binaries. You can do some astrophysics. You can do some cosmology. You can do some fundamental physics. So, uh, on the astrophysics side, one of the things that is unknown about Emery's are the properties of the black holes in which they're fall, fall. And so you can attempt to use Emery's to measure the black hole mass um, Now, if you assume, <laughs> so it's a big assumption that we've made this analysis, uh, and it needs to be looked at very carefully, if you assume that you can predict accurately how often Emery's occur in a black hole with a particular mass, 
then you can use emery's to measure the mass function. And you find that if you have just 10 emery's, you can already constrain the slope to the level of plus or minus 0.3, which is the level of the current uncertainty. Um, so this looks promising, but the big uh, unknown here, or the big assumption here, is that we can decouple this uncertainty and how often uh, emery's occur from the uh, uncertainty in the number of black holes uh, there are. Um, Emery's could be used for cosmology in the same way that uh, you can use neutral cell binaries in LIGO. Um, if you have an EM counterpart, you, since you get a typical distance measurement of a few percent with an Emery, uh, that translates to the same precision in the Hubble constant measurement if you've got a, an accurate redshift. Um, and so by combining Emery's, you get the accuracy to improve um, and uh, like three over the square root of n, um, and so with ten events, you're down to one percent precision. Um, there is a mechanism that could give an EM counterpart to memory, an and that is if it was a white dwarf in spiral, and the black hole in the center is light and rapidly spinning, the white dwarf can get disrupted, and that can produce uh, emission. Uh, now the problem is that there are you know, three assumptions there: you need there to be a white dwarf, and the rates for those are a bit lower because of mass segregation. Uh, you need the black hole to be light, so it has to be about 10 to the 4 solar masses, and there aren't that many of those. Uh, we also have to have it to be spinning and close to extremal, so at least 0.95, uh, and that also reduces the problem. So it's likely we're not going to see counterparts to Emery's, we might, and then you can do this sort of thing. Um, even if you don't get a counterpart, you can do a statistical analysis, in which basically you take your LISA data, you use it to infer where roughly the Emery is in the universe, and you point a telescope or look at a galaxy catalog and find where all the galaxies are within that error box. Okay? So neutron stars or any other types of global stars the Uh yeah, so because the uh, because least black holes are big, um, the tidal forces at the horizon are not strong enough to disrupt a neutron star. Um, so you need something that is less tightly bound, like a white dwarf. You also need the, to push those tidal forces up by uh, having it spin fast so you can get a bit closer, and having it low mass so the tidal effects are bigger. So you, uh, it's not possible for a neutron star with lisa type black holes, and even for a white dwarf, you need the black holes with low mass. And uh, so normal stars, yeah, they, they also get tidally disrupted by any uh, piece of like black hole, but they get disrupted a bit too early. <laughs> so you don't actually see enough of the in-spiral to detect them before the disruption takes place. Um, there has been some discussion, uh, so in, it was in the early 2000s, uh, this prospect of maybe seeing um, gravitational <coughs> waves from a main sequence star orbiting the black hole in the center of our galaxy up until the point it's disrupted. Um, that I haven't heard people talk about that more recently, but it's not possible to I'll certainly look for it. But outside of our galaxy, the stars don't get close enough to the black holes before disruption to be detected. Um, so, coming up to the statistical method, what we do is we say we have an emery roughly here, these are all the two galaxies it could be in. Um, if it's in uh, this galaxy, then the whole constant must have this value, it's this one, it's this value, it's this value, and so on and so forth. And so you get a distribution of possible Hubble constant values, which as you um, add more and more events, um, eventually converges uh, to a distribution, which hopefully is not the right Hubble constant value. Um, so Analysis of this was done by McLeod and Hogan back in 2008 for the classic Lisa configuration. This is the 5 million kilometer one. And they estimated that with 20 emeries and redshift less than a half, you could get a Hubble constant measurement of 1%. Um, now, the uncertainty, so this assumed that we had a better detector than the one that's going to be built. Um, and so we're not going to do as well as this. But if you're pessimistic, then maybe. This 20 emery is giving you to a 2% measurement rather than a 1% measurement, and so 80 emery is giving you to 1%. Um, 
um, and model <coughs> predictions, if you know, these astrophysical models are at all realistic, we do typically have the right number of plates and low redshift uh, to get these sorts of precisions. Um, now, it is likely that if our predictions for LIGO are right, LIGO will have got to this level before these uh, flies. And so this is now no longer as exciting a science uh, result that Lisa could produce because LIGO probably gets there sooner. But that depends a lot on the rate in which some mergers, which after one event uh, is still a bit uncertain. Oops. Uh, so, yeah, not sure what that slide is there. Um, okay, so the you know, other big science application of memories is to probe black holes, um, and in particular testing the no hair property. Um, so the <coughs> idea here is that you get, you have these 100,000 cycles in the strong field region, um, and because the orbit of the small object is eccentric, Mind, it's exploring a lot of the uh, the space time uh, outside the black hole. Okay, so these are uh, movies uh, showing a typical orbit, a small object um, on the eccentric orbit around the black hole. This is the orbit of the view from above. This is from the side. Uh, this is the effective radial potential that's moving in. Um, and this is uh, an approximation. This is one of the clues models for the gravitational wave emission. But you see a fairly rich structure here. You get bursts of higher frequency and amplitude radiation when the object is close to the black hole, um, and it's lower amplitude and frequency further away. This is what we call zoom and whirl, if you read that in the literature. Um, and then the whole pattern is modulated as a result of the fact that the orbital plane processes uh, with respect to your line of sight. So there's a lot of structure there, and that structure is telling you about uh, the potential in which the uh, object is moving. Um, and so, in principle, you can measure that potential, you can extract the multiple moments, and you can check whether they're consistent with what we expect for a curve black hole, uh, which is this no hair relationship um, in appropriate definitions, and then also I so many times I have to look. Okay, so um, this was formalized a bit in the 90s by Clinton Ryan. Uh, he showed that um, the, if you, for a space-time that was constructed as a sum of different multiple components. He showed that things you can observe with the, with the gravitational waves, such as the number of cycles spent at a particular frequency, um, and more directly, the uh, frequency of the perihelion precession and the orbital plane precession as a function of the orbital frequency. He showed that uh, these quantities that you can observe encode the different multiple moments uh, so in the case of the precession frequency, you can see that uh, you have a leading order term as a function of omega, which depends on mass. You then have the next order term, which depends on spin. You have the next order term, which depends on the mass quadrupole, uh, and so on. So in principle, you go out, you see some gravitational waves, you extract from that gravitational waves, uh, or gravitational waveform, the, uh, the frequencies at, as a function of time, and then you can plot Omega precession as a function of omega, um, and do a fit to different orders and read off the coefficients one after the other. And so this was the, the principle of uh, space time mapping. Uh, it's slightly, well, it's extremely um, difficult to uh, do this uh, in the way that Ryan demonstrated. Uh, because you need infinite numbers of multiples to characterize curve. So subsequent work is mostly focused on starting with a curve black hole and deforming it in uh, some way or another, and looking at how uh, well you can measure the size of that uh, perturbation using a gravitational wave observation. So there are lots of studies on this. This is an example from uh, Lyon uh, around Kepler. Um, they uh, took their analytic kludge model and basically added in an extra term to it that represented the effect of an excess quadrupole on the center of the black hole. And they found that they could measure the size of this uh, deviation of the quadrupole moment at a level of 10 to the minus 3 uh, for a, a million cell mass at the center of the black hole, uh, while simultaneously measuring the mass and the spin to a part of 10 to the 4. Okay, so there's potentially a very powerful test here. You can measure this deviation of the quadrupole moment. 
Um, to put it in perspective, if you have a, a boson star, this deviation can be all the unity. Um, so a 10 to the minus 3 measurement is uh, very precise. Um, in okay, uh, so there's been lots of work on uh, what you can do using emeries to understand the uh, structure outside a black hole. Um, I'll mention a few of them, I don't have time to go into any details, and there's papers on this. Uh, people looked at um, so the presence or absence of a horizon. Uh, if, obviously if the horizon is not there, we don't really know what it's going to look like because we need the model of that system. But crudely speaking, because there's a horizon in the system, the Emory cuts off pretty fast uh, when it reaches the ISCO. Um, but if you didn't have a horizon, then maybe something you'd have persistent emission for a bit longer. Um, there was a crude calculation which I was involved back in the early 2000s, this is not realistic, uh, but it was just a, a qualitative statement about what could potentially happen uh, if you were falling into a boson star. It's important to start passing into the boson star material, but the orbit is still uh, still visible to the outside, and so you continue to get gravitational radiation um, after it should have ended. Um, Another thing that's encoded in the emission is tidal coupling effect. Uh, so this is, as Eric was saying yesterday, black holes can't spawn. It makes this um, in a static situation, but they, if you're constantly perturbing it with a time-dependent potential, then you have a, a, you know, a time-dependent perturbation which uh, can dissipate extra energy. And so this notion of the tidal coupling um, effect uh, the way to think about it is that you're losing uh, energy into the horizon through the tidal interaction. Um, and so, the, so in principle, what you can measure from your gravitational wave signal is the energy coming to infinity, because that's the, your h dot squared that you measure directly from the gravitational waves. You can measure the rate at which energy is being lost from the orbit because that's the rate at which the system is in-spiraling, which affects the phasing of the gravitational waves that you're observing. Uh, and the difference between those is the energy that's going into the, uh, the black hole itself that's going into the horizon. Um, now, this is, this is a small fraction of the total. You can't measure, so measuring deviations in it is difficult. Uh, in this paper by Lovelace in 2007, they showed that if you, you, you could tell that energy was going into the horizon as opposed to not, uh, but uh, that was a that was a good So you could tell an order unity difference, um, but nothing smaller. Um, other things that you potentially can detect are is the presence of material in the space time. So if you've got matter there, it perturbs the orbit, that leads to a slightly different emission. Uh, if you have a second supermassive black hole at a distance, that gives you a tidal field, which also affects the orbit that you can uh, see. Um, these external effects, the astrophysical effects, tend to get weaker as you get closer to plunge, whereas anything that's a, a deviation in central objects, so um, a departure from the no hair theorem, would tend to get stronger as you get closer. Uh, and so the hope is that we'd be able to distinguish the two uh, from that uh, evolution of the strength of the universe. This is, uh, nobody has actually looked at situations in which we have two things going on and considered one thing at a time. Um, and so that's is an open question, although the hope is that it's not a problem. Um, now, if we did, so this is a, a diagram I made, but um, yeah, let's suppose we go and we see an Emory and we extract multiple moments and we see something that's inconsistent with GR. Then there are lots of explanations, um, so we have to you know, try and figure out what's going on. Um, so, Assume GR is correct in vacuum and uh, it's symmetric. Under those assumptions, we can extract the multiple moments and then we can just uh, test this for consistency. If it's consistent, then we look at whether these uh, moments are what we expect them to be for the Kerr metric. Um, if um, we then ask if the emission has a plane to its horizon, we can extract a tidal interaction and so on. Um, and, but then there are various other probabilities. Inconsistent, then we have to allow for there to be stuff, maybe just physical explanations, um, or on the GR, and 
And so you go through this process of trying to analyze what the problem is. Um, some of these questions are more easily answered if there are di distinctions between the uh, size of effects or the uh, what I was just saying about getting stronger or weaker during the interval. Uh, but I think there are likely to be 100 papers if we ever see an MRE that's inconsistent with GR. Um, with, which will have different explanations. It will be very interesting um, and you know, potentially uh, transformational of our understanding of black holes. Okay, uh, so it's the first half of the lecture, I've got about half an hour for the second half. Um, so I won't <laughs> spend, I probably won't get through all of this stuff. I'm going to say a little bit now about gravitational background elements and about those sources of continuous waves. Uh, there's some stuff at the end on the continuous waves, which I suspect I won't get to. Uh, it's fine, there's lines will be uh, given slides to vary and they can put them somewhere. Um, and so you can have a look at those uh, yeah, at your leisure. Um, so these other types of source uh, we mentioned a bit yesterday when we were estimating detectabilities. Um, I'll say a little bit about the physics of them today. Uh, so firstly, backgrounds. Um, as I said yesterday, there is a chance that there will be diffuse emission uh, at uh, all frequencies. Uh, that is stochastic, so we can't predict uh, its amplitude or phase very precisely. Uh, <coughs> but there will be this extra energy that's going into the uh, gravitational detector that in principle we can detect. Um, there are two different types of stochastic backgrounds you'll hear people talk about. There are stochastic backgrounds that are cosmological, and there are those that are astrophysical. So a cosmological background is basically anything that was generated in the very early universe. So you've got relic radiation from the um, early universe that uh, is in gravitational waves and we see today. Um, astrophysical backgrounds, these are generated by sources that um, of normally individually resolvable in principle, but there are so many of them, and they're sufficiently far away and sufficiently weak uh, that uh, we can't distinguish them from one another. And so we end up with this effectively stochastic foreground. So um, one of the, the calculation of the gravitational energy, energy density for an inspiral population that I went through yesterday was this type of astrophysical uh, foreground. Okay, so cosmological backgrounds. Um, this diagram is somewhat old, but it captures the main, uh, the main message, uh, which is that the predictions of standard cosmological models are that there will be gravitational wave backgrounds, but their amplitude will be very low. So we expect there to have been gravitational waves generated in the early universe um, through slow growth. Uh, but the background will typically be much lower than where we would expect to place constraints with these uh, events like a uh, deposit. Okay. Now, there are models that do give you backgrounds um, in your detectors. Um, so, one of them uh, is the distance of cosmic strings. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and, but then you'll also notice so these give broad band backgrounds that can be quite high, so that's plausible if you believe in cosmic strings. Uh, you'll also notice that there are some curves here that uh, nicely go up at exactly the frequency where we have a gravitational wave detector. Um, these are the exotic models which essentially work by taking all of this gravitational wave energy and focusing it at the frequency where we have a gravitational wave detector. And if you do that, you can get these backgrounds higher to be seen by these little LIGO. Um, there are physical reasons, physical processes that could do that. For LISA, uh, the frequency of all the communicants corresponds to the gravitational waves that would have been generated uh, at the terror electron volt scale in the early universe, uh, which is where you expect the electron weak phase transition to take place. So there are models which produce backgrounds at TEV um, that could potentially appear in the Lisa band. Uh, but these are somewhat speculative. The basic expectations that we 
the background is going to be too low. Uh, you need a detector that has a couple of orders of magnitude more sensitivity uh, and laser uh, in order to get an So that's, uh, you may come across papers that talk about something called BBO, the Big Bang Observer. That mission was, the concept was designed exactly to go after this uh, inflationary background. Uh, and they will operate in the decimals band a few years and a while ago because uh, there aren't that many uh, other astrophysical uh, foregrounds there. Okay, so uh, in terms of astrophysical foregrounds, there are lots of possibilities here. Um, there are backgrounds in Malaga, there are backgrounds in Lisa. Um, the so the ones that have been discussed, so LIGO, uh, the individual binaries that we're seeing is things like GW, GW 79, uh, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 14, and so on. Um, those sources at greater distances you can't resolve with high enough SNR, but they are needing some kind of signal in your data. Um, whereas a background that comes from the stellar binary mergers uh, at greater distances. For Lisa, you Expect to see a background from uh, stellar binaries in you know, the Milky Way. These are typically white dwarf binaries because there are many more of them, and also stellar binaries, stellar binaries. These are not things that are merging, these are things that have a period of about uh, an hour, so they're far from merger, um, but there are lots of them in the galaxy. And so there are about 10 million uh, white dwarf binaries at an hour periods. In our galaxy, they're all producing gravitational waves in the Lisa band. If the numbers of extreme mass ratio wind spirals are at the high end of the range I was talking about, so they, if we're talking about the thousands of events rather than the tens of events, then there's a possibility that Emery's outside our detection horizon will also be contributing uh, to a background for Lisa. Supermassive black hole mergers, there aren't going to be enough of these in the Lisa band. We're talking a few tens of events, they'll all individually be resolvable. We can see them with high SNR everywhere. But at lower frequencies, you expect there to be more of these supermassive black hole mergers, uh, and they're in the early stages of evolution when the amplitude of the radiation is less. Uh, and so we expect there to be a background of supermassive black holes at the nanohertz frequencies where pulsar timing uh, is going to be sensitive. Okay, so uh, going through these one at a time. For LIGO, the stellar binary stochastic background, um, the constraints, so we now can predict fairly well what the level this will have because we've observed um, a bunch of, uh, observed a bunch of binaries. Um, so this is the current prediction. This came from um, the after the 17817 neutron star detection. Um, the, you'll see that there are three lines on this plot, so three colored lines and three black lines. So the black line, so this is omega gravitational wave. This is what I was talking about yesterday, the energy density normalized to the closed density of the universe in the gravitational wave background. Um, and it's a function of, of frequency. Um, these black curves indicate uh, it's an estimate of the sensitivity that would be achieved uh, doing a cross-correlation search with the two LIGO interferometers um, using all of the data in the second science run and the two using all of it in the third science run and then doing a year of observation um, at design sensitivity. Uh, the green line here is the contribution from binary black holes in the background, the red in binary neutral stars, and the blue is the combination, the reason that the red kind of overtakes the green at some point is because they have lower mass and so they plunge at higher frequencies. Um, you'll see the blue line here is just below where we expect to get to in the next science run. Uh, it's completely above where we uh, would expect to be with a year of uh, design sensitivity. This panel on the right hand side um, is an estimate of the SNR you would have in the, coming out of your background cross correlation search um, as a function of operation time. So, at O3, SNR is 23, uh, I think it's the start of O3, SNR is less than 0.1. Um, at the end of O3, we might get to an SNR of 2, 
we saw on the, the detection. Um, once we started to get the results, we had to be able to uh, level up three sigma, and then um, after all of these observations and results, we reached this uh, five sigma critical threshold. Uh, for Lisa, uh, the level of the uh, white wall background has been estimated. Uh, the Remember from the scaling of things we talked about yesterday, we expect SH to uh, be um, uh, the minus seven thirds, which is what we have here. here. The pre factor is the thing we can't wait for in the population. Um, what is not, so this is the total binary background, uh, including all light warps in our galaxy, uh, all the external galaxies. What it doesn't allow for is the fact that we're going to see, we're going to be able to individually resolve some of them. Um, so there's a way you can uh, quantify that by uh, basically assuming um, you use some of the information to, so you need a certain number of frequency bins, basically, K uh, required to find uh, So there's a certain way you can allow for um, extraction of binaries. Okay. Now we expect the confusion noise from white dwarfs to be dominant at the lowest frequencies for Lisa. This is a recent paper, so it's using the current design configuration for Lisa. Um, the green curve here is, so the black curve underneath is the noise in Lisa. The green curve is the sum of the instrumental noise and the white dwarf binary. Um, the other colored curves are what happens uh, as you try and subtract your bright white dwarfs. So, uh, there's a sequence of iterations um, as you get more data, uh, and that you see that you uh, are always dominated by this confusion of other frequencies. So you start to do a bit better at higher frequencies because you're resolving uh, more and more of the individual sources as you add more and more data. Uh, for Emery's, um, as I said earlier, it's a, it depends a lot on what their rates are. Uh, the only estimate of this that's been done was for uh, the um, well, classic least configuration. Uh, there are three curves here. Uh, this is the blue, so the solid line is the instrumental noise. Um, the lower to dash lines is what you get if you add in the white dwarf confusion background that I was just talking about, uh, allowing for this fitting out the sources. So it's slightly different to that previous plot, which was uh, based on simulations, but um, the dwarf is similar. Uh, and then this slightly higher dash curve is what you predict if you also uh, include confusion noise from uh, white dwarf memories, um, which you can't individually resolve. But Okay, so there's a slight increase in the level of the background, um, but that was assuming um, the Emory rate was at the high end. Uh, so if the Emory rate is at the high end, this will still be the case because it's clearly dominating over the white dwarf background in certain cases. And since we can still see the white dwarf background, we will still be able to see the Emory confusion background. However, uh, it's more likely that the error rate is a factor of 10 lower than was assumed here, and at that point, uh, you'll never see it. Um, in the pulsar timing band, that's where we expect to see a background from supermassive black holes. Um, and there are various predictions uh, of this. This is uh, a few years ago. Um, the uh, so these colored bands in the middle of these plots are the predictions for the level of the background and the star indicates uh, indicated the upper limit on the amplitude of background that had been attained using the pulsar timing at that point. Um, so it's a, about all of these, um, but uh, and we haven't detected it yet, so that's uh, all consistent. Um, the current expectation is that these sorts of models which predict the background uh, as an amplitude red to the minus 15 uh, at a frequency of 1 over a year. 
we should see something with pulsar timing within the next uh, five to ten years. Um, so, for LIGO, uh, coming back to the cosmological background uh, briefly, um, LIGO has placed limits on the level of the background, uh, and the most recent one of these, uh, the limit is uh, 1.7 times 10 to the 7. Um, so, this is two orders of magnitude better than the limit on the gravitational wave contribution to the energy density that you get from looking at uh, the synthesis constraints. Um, the my goes big thing about beating this limit uh, a few years ago. Um, the limit is better now, um, but we still haven't detected the background, but we have detected expect to. Another thing like has done is place directional limits. So you, rather than looking for a stochastic background that is isotropic, so it's the same amplitude in all directions, you place point, uh, you place limits on point-like emission in particular directions. And so you basically process your data to look at a particular sky location, uh, and then you constrain the energy density on the sky location. Uh, and these are the most recent results um, of that uh, in this uh, same paper that's referenced there. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is just uh, a few comments about science and I do see backgrounds, these are cosmological background that tells us about the early universe, which will be uh, very exciting. These um, stellar backgrounds tell us about cell populations. So the shape of the background encodes some information, not just about the small number of events you see uh, resolved directly, but about the whole population, so there can be some information there that is uh, complementary. Um, the white wall background, and the, so the emery background will tell us something about properties of uh, emery's, if you can see it, uh, it tells us about their relative numbers of white wall and black and spirals. Uh, it also could tell us something about these formation channels, because if we're dominated by the standard capture process, Centric orbits, which have emission of a wider range of frequencies, uh, whereas the other channels do circular orbits, and so then you don't have the power more concentrated. Uh, so this affects the shape of the background. So if you saw it and you measured that shape, then you could start to uh, tease out uh, the different contributions. Um, yeah, and then in the pulsar timing case, one thing that people have started to look at is whether uh, what information is encoded in the isotropy of the background, um, and that is mostly telling us about the spatial distribution of sources uh, on the sky. Um, so, uh, for Lisa, the cosmological backgrounds, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the way in which you get a detectable background in the Lisa band is if you have a lecture week gravitational waves being produced by electrical phase transitions in the early universe. Um, and so if Lisa detects such a background, and that tells us about this physics of the TU scale. So this paper from a couple of years ago looked at a number of different uh, exotic scenarios for producing backgrounds in the Lisa band. These are the colored curves here, and uh, green and flat. Um, so there were a number of different scenarios considered for the, uh, these light colored uh, bands, green, blue, purple, and red, uh, are what you'd expect to be able to constrain uh, using Lisa. Um, so the interpretation, I think, uh, these were the different assumptions about emission. We would probably look, should be looking at the purple curve based on the current configuration. Um, if your line lies in, goes above the purple region, then you it's in principle something that is detectable. Uh, so for these models, uh, they're doing what we saw on the previous diagram, they're putting all that power at a particular frequency where Lisa is sensitive, uh, and that's <coughs> enough to make something uh, detectable. So that would be exciting if we observed it, we'll certainly look for it, um, but it is rather speculative because you have to tune your models quite a lot uh, to get this. Okay, uh, so that was backgrounds. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about bursts now. 
so a burst source is uh, essentially something that is um, short in duration, uh, but also generally broadband in frequency. It's essentially something we can't model. Um, somebody asked me about this yesterday. They said, you know, when you said, like, I hadn't seen any bursts, uh, what about 1509-14? Um, it is true that uh, the first binary black holes that Lisa, that, that LIGO detected were seen with burst searches, um, as well as with internal searches. Uh, I, we don't call those bursts because they are at any time, they're not brought back in frequency, they are uh, evolving in a specific, uh, predictable way. With bursts, they're things that you can't model that phase evolution very precisely. You tend to get uh, diffuse emission over a range of frequencies um, and over a short period of time. Uh, so things that produce these bursts, transients might be supernovae, you can get them from cosmic strings, um, and you can also potentially get them from neutron star, Quakes uh, and from black hole mergers. This is the case I was just telling you about. Um, if you a merger is a is a bit burst like, uh, although it's something that you, can do, you can always do better collecting these things using a template uh, than you can just by looking for uh, a burst signal. Um, so to get radiation from a supernova, you need uh, something asymmetric happening. Um, Asymmetric rotating coursework from an asymmetric anyway. So, there are a number of different mechanisms that have been proposed uh, to get emission, uh, very short emission from supernovae. Uh, the most, um, yeah, so I think the most plausible is uh, there, the, um, I'm trying to remember, it's called ADAF model. Uh, you basically get this asymmetric um, accretion onto the uh, proto neutron star core that can produce quite a lot of gravitational wave uh, emission um, in the final stages of the supernova. So, people do simulations of supernovae and they predict what these signals will look like, um, but typically you get something that has power of a range of frequencies and a range of time. And uh, here are a few simulations. This is, uh, these are all taken from this paper, though. Spade was talking about data analysis for these things, it wasn't actually doing the simulations itself. Um, they, you know, the different models produce slightly different looking signatures, so you can attempt to, uh, there are different characteristics here, really this looks very different to the previous one, um, and so you might hope that if you saw a burst, you could tell the difference between something that was doing this, uh, and something that was doing this, or something that was doing this uh, and so on. So there is some hope that there is physics you can extract, um, but you need to be able to uh, extract some sort of information about this burst morphology, uh, how the emission is distributed over frequency and time. Um, so the other type of burst source uh, that is looked for in LIGO and will be looked for in LISA uh, is from cosmic strings. So cosmic strings are topological defects produced by um, phase transitions in the other universe. They're one-dimensional structures, that's why they're called strings. Um, it's basically a, a 1D uh, energy distribution. But you can get you can have uh, closed strings or open strings. These things are on uh, loops. So the closed strings are loops, the open strings just uh, go to infinity. The, Open strings are essentially ruled out by other observations of, lens, of lensing and so on. But you can still have cosmic string loops. Um, if you have loops, uh, then uh, there can be waves that propagate around the loops, um, and this can lead to gravitational wave emission. Because if you have a left and right moving node and they meet, you can get a point of the string that is traveling temporarily at this close to the speed of light, and it generates a uh, burst of gravitational radiation. Um, so this is slightly different to the supernova model in the sense that you can predict what the waveform uh, is likely to look like, um, and so you do have you can do model searches for these as well. Okay, so these cosmic string cusps could be sources for both uh, LIGO and LISA. This paper is a bit old. 
with the infections for um, the background that you get from a superposition of all of these cusps uh, in the lower band and the least band, the patch lines indicate the sensitivity, uh, this was a visual ligo and advanced ligo. Um, so it looks more promising for LISA than it does for LIGO, but the whole thing is rather speculative because we really have no idea whether these things were produced and if so, how many of them were. But it's one of the things that um, is being looked for, and LIGO has placed uh, limits on it. Um, this is the most recent LIGO result, um, which basically the way these limits are placed are sort of the energy density and the constraint background. Uh, as a function of frequency, um, and then you can translate that into the rate density, so the number of uh, cosmic string related bursts uh, that occur per uh, unit volume being in time, uh, again, as a function of frequency. So these are all up limits because we haven't seen any of these events, um, but the up limits are improving over time. Um, these, this is a slightly different analysis, uh, which is Long bursts of gravitational waves, long and short bursts of gravitational waves, but uh, the conclusions are probably similar. You've got upper limits uh, on energy as a function of uh, frequency. Okay. Um, yeah, this slide is not important. Uh, this one is. Translates those limits that we have on burst amplitudes into limits on physical quantities that characterize the cosmic string network. Um, the, the primary property of a string is the, the energy density per unit length, that's its uh, the, the tension in the string, um, and then the rate at which uh, strings encounter one another that affects the background uh, that is connected to something called the intercommunication probabilities, that's the probability that you get a burst uh, from the string network. Um, and so as uh, this is shape of region is basically what is allowed uh, by uh, the observations um, and as we are uh, as is improving, we're reducing the allowed parameter space uh, more and more. Okay, um, so yeah, we are nearly at lunch. Um, so I spent five minutes saying a little bit about continuous wave sources and then we'll stop. Um, and as I said, if you want to look at the slides afterwards to see the few things that I haven't covered uh, and have any questions. Um, but I do want to say a couple of things about continuous waves. So what we mean by continuous wave is essentially a monochromatic source. So this is a source that is constantly emitting gravitational waves over a long period of time, and usually at approximately a constant frequency. So now the primary source of this LIGO uh, is a rotating neutron star. Uh, neutron stars rotate very stably. If they have anything that deforms them, so they have a time change of Hodgepole moment, you get gravitational wave uh, emission. Okay, now possibilities for producing these deformations are asymmetries in the crust, uh, fluid modes in the core <coughs> that are unstable, uh, or possibly also free, pre free precession of the star so that the rotation and symmetry axes uh, don't uh, coincide and so the star wobbles and they can also produce gravitational waves. Um, so you can characterize the size of these deformities in terms of elasticities, which are basically uh, differences in the quadrupole moment components. Um, if you're interested in crustal deformities, then the maximum deformation you can support is of the order of 10 to the minus 7. Um, if you remember, we estimated a strain yesterday, assuming epsilon was order 1. Um, and that looks quite promising, but if you reduce that to a factor of 10 minus 7, then um, it's not a surprise we haven't seen any of these uh, so far. Um, you can, if you have things that were more exotic than neutron stars, uh, 
quark stars or um, of various flavors, then you can support greater deformities. Um, so you can interpret some like your results as placing constraints on the existence of uh, quark stars, um, but uh, it's rather speculative. Um, another way to correct the uh, uh, form deformities on the surface is by accretion. If you have a, um, a neutron star in a binary, the accretion process can create hot spots, uh, and that can lead to electron capture, which produces a magnetic on the surface of the uh, neutron star. It can give you about to see as high as 10 to the minus 5, um, but again, that is requires quite a lot of fine-tuning, and so it's somewhat unlikely. Um, so the other mechanism for getting these deformities uh, from neutron stars is fluid modes. So you have the neutron stars rotating, um, and you can get instabilities in the fluid dynamics that leads to more <coughs> term stable deformations that therefore radiate gravitational waves. Uh, so the one that was most popular in the late 90s and early 2000s was the R mode, um, and uh, people made so consistent. Uh, it's called an R mode because the restored force is Coriolis uh, force, so it's a rotation uh, induced instability. Um, and the uh, yeah, and the reason this is thought to be interesting is that you see quite a lot of uh, low mass X-ray binaries. Uh, building up, sort of piling up a particular frequency, which is the frequency where it's estimated for a 1.4 solar mass neutron star, this R mode instability would kick in. So it's thought that this might have been quite a goal to this point, and then you get this R mode instability, and then they start radiating quite a lot of energy and gravitational waves, um, and so we should look for continuous waves at about this R mode frequency. We haven't seen any so far after a few. A couple of years of observation, um, so this model is no longer quite so popular, uh, but it was the, the big hope uh, for seeing something with initial LIGO. Um, okay, so since we need to finish, um, I'll skip a couple of things and then just talk about uh, what, um, what results we have from LIGO. Um, LIGO searches for both known pulsars and unknown pulsars. Uh, for known pulsars, you have a model of the gravitational waves, and so you can do match filtering um, because you're, you assume that uh, the gravitational wave emission comes out of the multiple of the rotation frequency of the known pulsar. Um, for unknown pulsars, then it's more difficult. You've got to do a bind search of parameter space, and these signals are very long. It's a continuous wave source that's present in all of your data. Um, and so you need to search with parameter space. So this is a bit like searching for Emery, so you've got to search for lots of templates. So this is hard, uh, then pulsars are a bit easier. Um, but uh, my go is looking for both, and I'll say this afternoon a little bit about the techniques used to find the other pulsars. So the limits, uh, this figure was annoying me, and it was the best I could do. It was the, annoying the poor resolution. Um, this is the most recent result from LIGO. What is shown here is the uh, limit on the strain as a function of frequency. So this is one of these characteristic strain plots I was talking about yesterday um, for a number of known uh, pulsars. It's the black diamonds here are LIGO limits, um, and the blue dots are uh, observations. Okay, so if we had <laughs> How do we observe the gravitational waves without using LIGO? Well, this observation is that uh, we can see that the pulsars are spinning down. So they're slowing down. Um, most likely, the, that's dominated by uh, magnetic effects. So the pulsar has a magnetic field. This is interacting with external plasma. And it leads to a breaking uh, of the system, so that slows down. But if you assume that all of the uh, spin down energy is being radiated into gravitational waves, you can get an estimate of the energy. Um, and so, this is what's called the spin down limit. Um, and for a couple of famous pulsars, Beamer and Crab, 
the signal limits are now a couple of the energy, the four of the energy, the and uh, or the half or crab uh, above the LIGO limit. So um, <coughs> we know that now that this magnetic breaking process is taking place because not all of this energy is coming out of the waves. Uh, we've been listening to the limit from a few other pulsars now as well, and we've got this constantly coming down. The hope is at some point you'll stop setting up a limit so you actually start uh, detecting. Um, but it, is, it was expected that most of the energy goes into uh, this magnetic breaking effect, not into radiational waves. Uh, so this is confirming uh, expectation. Um, so this. <coughs> okay. uh, two more things to say, and we'll go to lunch. Uh, this is the formula that's been down a little bit um, that I was just talking about. And this table summarizes uh, how the upper limit, where the current y upper limit is relative to the spin uh, limit. So you see the form of um, the crown, the real up pulsar. We're computing by a factor of 10, uh, or factor of uh, 4, uh, for some of the others, we're uh, computing by a factor of 2, um, and we're getting close to it. Uh, you can translate that into a uh, ratio of the amount of energy that's being lost um, uh, from the rotation to the amount of energy that could be being emitted in, in gravitational waves. Uh, for unknown pulsars, uh, LIGO has also set limits. Uh, and this is again the most recent result. Uh, these limits are done as a function of frequency. Uh, so we say, you know, what is the maximum uh, amplitude of a pulsar at frequency of 1,000? 1,100 hertz. That uh, could have been in the data, and we've not seen it. Uh, and you get uh, so lots of black points here. That's, the different points come from different realizations, so there's some estimate of uncertainty there. Uh, and this red is. Uh, so we're setting limits on strains for uh, unknown pulsars that are available 10 to the minus 23 to 10 to the minus 24. Uh, this compares to the limits on uh, the known pulsars, which are 10 to the minus 24 to 10 to the minus 25. The fact we're doing it all to make it better for known pulsars is the fact that we can use this information and we don't have to search over a big parameter space uh, in order to get this. Okay, uh, we'll stop there. This afternoon I'll talk about data analysis. Um, the, there are a few slides I haven't got to. Uh, they are about galactic binaries, uh, which is the type of continuous wave source we expect to see from Lisa. Um, these are the one period binaries that also form that background as mentioned earlier. Uh, there's some information there if you want to look at it. If you don't, that's fine. Um, it's not as interesting as some of the other stuff, so uh, we will leave it and go and eat something.